This is the church called Pater Noster. In Latin means our father. It has a lot of history here. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that history later because we have a window to go down into the grotto. This was a church built over the place where it's believed that the disciples found Jesus praying and said, teach us to pray. It's also the believed place where Christ gave the Olivet Discourse found in Matthew 24 and the place where Christ ascended to heaven in Acts 1. So this is an extremely important site and we're going to see and learn all about it. So we're going to pick up this talk later because once again it's right here so follow me so you can see this. This is a cave. It's a natural cave but there was a small church chapel down here and so you'll see the apse on your left. Okay, You're going to see some remains on your right down in here. So this is kind of a grotto which is a holy place that's set aside for the belief place where Christ was praying. Once again, we have no reason to doubt that this is not authentic because these sites, once again, were set aside by these early Christians. They didn't forget them. They were venerated. And then later on, there would be formal churches built over them. So the church that's above us was built right over this spot. X marks the spot right here. So you're in the very place where Jesus was praying. Now let's look around this site and see a little of its history and points of interest. Then we'll walk to a special place that overlooks Old City Jerusalem and the site where it's believed Christ gave the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. While there, we'll talk about the Olivet Discourse and the Lord's Prayer. We'll also see some faith lessons we can learn from this site, so I think this should be special and speak to our lives today. So soon after Christ ascended to heaven, early Christians venerated this site because of its significance. Writing in around 318 AD, Eusebius, Bishop of Caesarea, was an eyewitness account to this site. He writes about how Jesus was upon the Mount of Olives at the cave that is shown here. And at the ridge of the Mount of Olives, he prayed and handed on to his disciples the mysteries of the end. And after this, he made his ascension into heaven. Around 330 AD, a church was commissioned and built by Constantine on the site marked out by Helena, the mother of Constantine. It was one of many churches that Constantine would build in the Holy Land. This Byzantine church that Constantine built was built over a cave, which according to tradition, was the place Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. It was first named the Church of Eleona, which means Olive Grove. Then later, in around 1100 AD, its name was changed by the Crusaders to Paternoster Church, which, as we mentioned, means Our Father, because it refers to the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. The Persians destroyed the church in 614 AD, but the memory of Jesus' teachings continued to be associated with it. Some of the Byzantine church remains can be seen in the backyard outside the present courtyard today. When the Crusaders arrived, the site was associated specifically with the Lord's Prayer, so the Crusaders rebuilt part of the church in 1099. In 1851, the remaining stones of the 4th century church were sold for tombstones in the Kidron Valley. The site was acquired by Princess Aurelia Bosi somewhere in the second half of the 19th century, which would be around 1860 AD, and a search for the cave mentioned by early pilgrims began. In 1868, she built a cloister and founded a Carmelite convent in 1872. A convent church was erected in the 1870s. In 1910, the foundations of the ancient church that once stood over the venerated cave were found, partly stretching beneath the modern cloister. 
the convent was moved nearby and reconstruction of the Byzantine church began in 1915. The half restored church has the exact dimensions as the original and the garden outside the three doors outlines the open aired area. The reconstruction was stopped in 1927 when funds ran out and the renewed church of Eleona remains unfinished which is Paternoster Church today. The tomb Princess Aurelia Bosi prepared for herself during her lifetime stands at the entrance of the modern church. She died in Florence in 1889 and her remains were brought to the church in 1957 according to her last wish. So this Princess Aurelia Bosi played a significant role in reestablishing this site from the 1800s to the present. The current church is overseen by the Carmelite cloistered sisters. It is very likely that Jesus prayed in this vicinity because he had just visited Mary, Martha, and Lazarus's home in Bethany, a short distance away. Jesus also regularly prayed on mountaintops, so the top of the Mount of Olives would be a natural fit. Once again, the church was built right over the, the grotto, right over the cave there. The one unique thing about this church is it has these plaques in over 140 different languages. The Lord's Prayer. Again, one thing built upon top of another. Now we're gonna do something special that virtually no other teams do or very, very few do. We're gonna actually walk down a path towards where Jesus would have walked and we're gonna look over some of the old city down there. Okay, so it'll be really a special little, little uh, nature walk, so to speak. So follow me. Is this the garden you're coming into? This is just a olive grove on top of the Mount of Olives. So this is an olive grove owned by this church. Very, very important real estate. I don't think that all of us combined would even be able to put a down payment on it. It's an olive grove. Once again, what is the name of this mount? The mount of what? Olives. Okay, so it's a, olive trees are very hardy. And so this is an olive grove up here. Okay, so we're just gonna kind of walk down through here because where we're walking is the top of the mountain or mount and this is very likely the same route that Jesus would have taken as he walked from where Mary and Martha lived which was in Bethany which is just down the hill from here he would have come right up here it's a mountain and he would pray up here and then they would the disciples would find him so we're just uh, on this probably the same path this is the place we can't see it completely now because we have trees in the way but it's believed that from here is where Christ gave the what's called the Olivet Discourse that's in Matthew 24 where he talks about the end times okay so we'll just walk down to the end here and we're gonna see if we can find a window there's some pomegranates right there Okay, go over here, we're gonna find a spot. I just wanna show you, if we can, I want you to see where the Dome of the Rock is, because right here is where the Olivet Discourse took place. The Olivet Discourse was given from the Mount of Olives. Yeah, so, yeah, so get where you can kinda of see. So we are directly over where the temple would have been. We're directly over the Temple Mount. Okay, now here in a short moment, we're going to be below this grove and we're gonna be looking at a viewing area of the old city. It's extremely popular. A lot of people are there. They're gonna to try to sell you everything under the sun, but that's okay. If you wanna buy stuff, buy stuff. Anyway, it's believed that from right up here is where Christ gave the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and then found also in Luke 21. Jesus, when he came up here to pray, he was coming from the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in Bethany, which is just this way right here, just goes down the hill. So it's very likely that when Jesus came up here to pray, he's gonna walk right in this vicinity right up here. 
And then, of course, Jesus was in this area when he gave the Olivet Discourse and ascended to heaven. It's also believed that Jesus would stay on the top of the Mount of Olives regularly when he came to Jerusalem. In fact, it would be likely he and his disciples slept in the cave at Paternoster Church here. So we are certainly right in the footsteps of Jesus. You will be in the footsteps of Jesus a lot today. Okay, and the whole time we're in, in Jerusalem. He traversed this whole area. By doing the math, we know that Jesus came from a very godly family, right? So how many times do you think in the life of Jesus he would come to Jerusalem counting his ministry years? Somewhere between 100 and 150 times Jesus would come here. During his ministry years, which were roughly three and a half, then he's going to come here probably at least 20 times, if not 25. And then when he would come here, he would minister here for a while. Now let's take a special time and talk about the Olivet Discourse that was preached from here from Jesus and about prayer. So this will be a special time. So let's begin with the Olivet Discourse. It says in Matthew 24, 1, it says, Jesus left the temple area and was going on his way when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. But he responded and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So this is believed that they were right up here when Jesus is speaking these words. And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name and they will mislead many people and you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for these things must take place. But that is not yet the end, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. And then they will hand you over to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. And at that time, many will fall away, and they will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will rise up and mislead many people. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will become cold, but the one who endures to the end is the one who will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Then he will go on and he will talk about, we already referred to it on the at the Chapel of Ascension, where uh, the nations will be gathered together, the sun will be darkened, the moon won't give its light, the stars will fall, the heavenly bodies will be shaken, and then will be the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, will come back in power and great glory. And then as we were just on the Mount of Ascension, so can you see, I can see the Chapel of Ascension right here, just right up above Paternoster. So then, once again, this is the believed place where Jesus gave the Olivet Discourse, found in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Also, as we've already looked at, the church up there is the believe place where Christ taught the disciples how to pray. So again, Jesus was at the house of Martha and Mary and Lazarus in Bethany, just down the hill here, makes his way up by himself, prays up here on a mountain, very common, Jesus did that all the time. And so he's praying up here, the disciples, where's Jesus? their leader, so they get up, they find him. They probably maybe had an idea because I think it was a regular occurrence of him. So they find him and they find him praying. And so they say, teach us how to pray. They're just really impressed with Jesus' prayer life. So Jesus prays to the Heavenly Father. I'll just say this for a moment for what it's worth. A lot of people have problems with the humanity of Jesus. And so they will struggle with thinking like Jesus is not fully God. Uh, Jesus claimed to be God, but what we have is we have 
in Isaiah 9, 6, we have, for a son will be given to us, a child will be born, and upon him the governments of the world will rest, it said he will be called Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, God Almighty. So the Son is referred to as what we call God in the flesh. So God chose to live among us to experience what we experience. So He, in His ability, it says in Philippians 2, 5-8, through 8, though being in the form of God and being equal with God, He emptied Himself and humbled Himself and took upon Himself the form of a person, human flesh. So what we see in Christ being 100% God, but He was also 100% human. And in that humanity, He's praying. He's still God. He has all of the omnipotence. He has all of the power. He cast out demons. He's powerful over everything. We talked about that in the Galilee area. But in His humanity, He will pray. And it will appear like we have two separate beings. We have something that's very hard to understand that only God can really do and explain, but we have God becoming a person and emptying Himself so that He can identify with us. So like it says in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, we don't have a high priest who can't empathize, sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to His throne to the throne of God so that we might receive help and mercy in time of need. So Jesus not only died for us, but He understands our situation. That's why He now is called our eternal high priest, so to speak. Okay, so in His humanity, He's praying, but He's still God. He's still God. So anyway, so the disciples come up here right where we were just at, but I'm going to read you the account here because it's a little more tranquil. So it says, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, the cave up here, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And he, Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed or holy be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Now this version is a condensed version. The version in the Galilee area that we find in Matthew is a longer version. That's the version that most of us would know if we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, etc. It would be really likely that Jesus didn't say these couple verses and then that was it. Now this is just a condensed. Jesus taught them. He would sit down and he would just teach them how to pray. But that's kind of the words that we have recorded. Now he's going to explain this little formal prayer. It's the verse right after it says in Luke 11:5. Then he said to them, this is when he's teaching them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children are in bed, and I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not give up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet, because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. <laughs> so we have the story of a man who he has a, he's going on a journey. And he uh, comes to a friend's house and says, can you give me some food? The guy says, we're all in bed, sorry. And uh, they're good friends, but the guy doesn't want to get up. Hey, sorry, buddy, <laughs> find somewhere else. But then he's just persistent. So what Jesus is going to teach us here is the law of persistence in our prayer. So he says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now suppose one of you, fathers, is asked by his son for a fish. 
he will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he has asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, having a sinful nature, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now we should clarify that this just isn't a license to just you know, say that you can just pray anything and then God's going to give it. You know, I'm going to pray that God's going to send lightning on an enemy. He's going to do that. I'm going to pray God's going to give me a million dollars. No, we're talking about prayers that are honoring God and are prayed in Jesus' name and are, are in alignment with His will. God loves us, and if one of your children asks you for some matches and they're one year old, are you going to give them a book of matches? No, you know what's best. So God is not going to give us things that are going to harm us. So it's not just a license to get anything that we want. But we do see also in Matthew 6, 9, this is the Sermon on the Mount, and he teaches them to pray. It says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses or their offenses against you, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So we have two occasions where Jesus is teaching on prayer, one on the Sermon on the Mount and the other right here. So all of us have the perfect prayer life. All of us pray like we should. All of us have no need to grow in our prayer life. <laughs> so let's head on out. No, just a couple things. Jesus set an amazing example for us how to pray. Also, in a few hours, we're going to be down at the bottom of the hill in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is praying, where his sweat becomes like drops of blood. Jesus prayed. He was always in communion with the Father. He said, if you don't believe my words, believe the works. What you're seeing is the Father in me working. The works that I do are not mine, they're the, of the Father's. Okay, so God and Jesus were one, yet they had this humanity, unique relationship when Christ was here in his humanity, that Jesus prayed. If Jesus prayed, boy, I guess we should do the same. I know we all struggle in our prayer life. I struggle as well. It's a fight, it's a battle, okay? Understand that it is just spiritual warfare. Understand that you're Sinful nature doesn't want to pray, okay? But don't let your sinful nature reign over you. When you don't feel like praying is probably when you need to pray the most, okay? And oftentimes what God will do is He will send us difficulties to deepen our relationship with Him. It's like the illustration of the shepherd in biblical times when they had a sheep that would wander, what would the shepherd do? Break its leg, why? We mend the leg up, and then that sheep would become dependent upon the shepherd, and they would build this unique uh, relationship. And so oftentimes that's what God will do in our lives. When do we pray the most? In difficult times. When life's great, it's like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, Lord, okay. You never pray like you do when you're in a real dire situation. Like Hannah pouring her heart out. Like Hezekiah down here in the temple when the Assyrians are all over this place. And then God's going to send an angel that kills 185,000 all around here. You're in this place as well, going back in time before Jesus. So we should pray. Jesus prayed. We should have regular times of prayer. How many times a day did Daniel pray? Three times. Okay, he had set aside times to pray. And I think that for us, we would be wise to build our lives around foundational priorities. Our foundational priorities are our time with God reading His Word. That's how He speaks to us primarily. We communicate through Him and vice versa through prayer. We should set aside, make appointments, have a time of where we have devotions or a quiet time, whatever you want to call it, where we pray, we read God's Word, we can uh, memorize God's Word, we can just have a set aside time with the Lord. And then we want to do our best to try to walk in the Spirit. That means throughout the day, I'm walking and living with God. I'm contemplating Him. I'm being led by a Spirit. I'm trying to do what He wants me to do. So we have a set time 
and then we have where it says pray without ceasing. So that doesn't mean that you can't eat, you can't work, you can't do anything. It just means that you're walking with God. Enoch walked with God. Walking with God basically means you're walking in the Spirit, you're in tune with God, doing what He wants, living with Him throughout your day. Saying yes to Him when He wants you to do stuff. Saying no when you know you shouldn't do things. So right in the area here, once again, the cave is where Jesus taught this, this time on, on prayer. So that's something that we want to value as well in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time here at this place where we can look out over the old city where you probably talked about end times and then also where you were here and you prayed and then the disciples saw you and you taught them how to pray. Lord, you're right here with us. You haven't left us. We're, you're right here, Lord Jesus. So, Lord Jesus, we would ask that you would help us, help us to grow in our walk with you, our prayer with you, our time with you, Lord. Help us to make these foundational principles of reading and praying and memorizing, to build them as priorities in our lives. That unless something unique happens, then we have these appointments with you. And then throughout the day, we walk with you. We listen to you and we walk with you. Lord, grant us grace. We can't do it by ourselves. Help us, Lord. Uh, teach us to pray individually as we grow with you. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.